So another test is dynamic con penetration test. So there are three penetration tests commonly used. One is a static uh, standard penetration test, then dynamic con penetration test, and static con penetration test (SPT, DCPT, and SCPT). Okay, SPT we saw yesterday. Different corrections for SPT we saw. So next comes uh, DCPT or dynamic con penetration test. So in the case of dynamic con penetration test, instead of a split spoon sampler, we use a cone with apex angle 60 degree. on this figure okay you can see the cone here all right this is what is used for a dynamic con penetration test con usually with an apex angle 60 degrees and instead of the split spoon sampler you connect this con at the bottom of the drill rod okay then you have a similar equipment you have the anvil you have the hammer you will have a free fall height of uh mm same 750 mm free fall height and 65 kg hammer and this cone is driven down into the soil okay instead of the split spoon sampler here we have a cone okay so this cone is driven into the soil and the blow count for a very 100 mm penetration is continuously noted in this case in spt it was 150 mm here we uh, find the blow count for every 100 mm penetration okay so uh, the cone is continuously driven into the soil until Uh, required depth or until the refusal same as that of spt okay so here also refusal is n greater than 54 100 mm penetration okay so once you have reached the refusal or the required depth you will uh, withdraw the drill rod and the cone is left behind in the ground you will withdraw this rod this cone is left behind okay so in this case as compared to spt the one important thing is that you are not collecting any samples here you are not retrieving any disturbed or undisturbed any kind of sample from the soil you are not retrieving you just find out the penetration resistance of the cone for a hammer of 65 kg free falling from a height of 750 mm all right for the specified uh, you know dimension cone okay this is what happens in dynamic cone penetration test another figure showing a schematic of the uh, method so in this case again number of blows for the 300 mm penetration is noted and that is designated as the ncd or dynamic con resistance so 100 mm 100 mm 100 mm like that three times you will do and you will sum it up and you will get the n value for con penetration test in the case of spt it was uh, 150 mm 150 mm so total 300 mm what was the n value n value means the number of blows required for uh, 300 mm penetration using a a uh, split spoon open drive split spoon sampler uh, connected to a uh, you know uh, i mean driven using a hammer of 65 kg free falling from a height of 750 mm right so here also the loads are same uh, but at the tip instead of a split spoon sampler you are using a cone right so again 300 mm penetration itself okay so you have uh, you know two types of cones 50 mm dia or 65 mm uh, dia so you can use it with that without bentonite slurry so bentonite slurry here it is used to remove the friction of the drill rod okay so this is a very quick test so it can cover large depth of exploration economically because you are not uh, you know you don't have to make a drill hole you don't have to make a bore hole then at the bottom of the bore hole you don't have to remove the churn bit or a a uh, cutting edge and then reconnect your open drive sampler and again do spt test collect samples retrieve it again change the open drive sampler for the churn bit again make the you know further advance with the bore hole continue with the same process again and again nothing is required here here you here you simply drive your cone into the soil that's it no sample collection or anything that, that's a disadvantage also but still you get a good uh data from this you get your ncd which can be correlated to uh the spt values right as you can see here all right so sample is not retrieved so the test is very fast and uh, uh, it can also give an idea about the subsoil profile local soil soft pockets and position of the rock stratum etc so these ideas you will get and another advantage is that you can correlate it with the spt value so you can see dynamic cone penetration resistance ncd is equal to 1.5 times n for depths less than 3 meter 1.74 for depths 3 to 6 and 2n for depths greater than 6 meter so why are we correlating this because this n values can be further correlated to different soil properties we saw that yesterday right i told you there are many empirical relations which connect soil properties to n value right so similarly you can correlate it uh, here also using these correlations and further correlating the n values with 
uh, soil properties. So this test will not give you any sample that you can take and uh, test it in the lab, but you will get a very good idea about a subsoil profile. All right. Then comes the static cone penetration test. As the name suggests, you are not going to provide any impact or hammer blows to drive your uh, cone. Here also you use a cone. So this is uh, also called just CPT, SCPT or CPT. So this is uh, adopted nowadays in place of SPT whenever and wherever the equipment is available. So it is used, uh, you know, generally it is used for soft clays, silts, fine to medium sand deposit, kind of, uh, you know, almost all the uh, soil types. So it's also called the Dutch cone test. So here also the apex angle of a 60 degree cone is used and base area is 10 centimeter square. So this, see these are different types of cones used in uh, CPT. You can see here, right? So this is connected to a data logger. So how you do this test is you will just you have a heavy equipment which is anchored on the soil which rests on the soil so uh, here you can see uh, there is a there are different uh, types and shapes of cones so this is connected to a data logger and uh, you know there are several sensors inside this okay there are many sensors inside this there are uh, you know pressure sensors uh, pore water pressure sensors uh, piezometers uh, you have uh, you know uh, seismic uh, uh, measurement sensors uh, all these sensors are, uh, you know, uh, kept inside these cones and these are driven into the soil and this this is continuously driven into the soil just like you you continuously insert it into the soil rather than applying an impact or, you know, hammering it down. You continuously drive it into the soil and what you get is a continuous record of all these parameters. All these sensors will measure all this and with the depth, how those parameters vary, you will get a continuous uh, record of all these data. Here you can see uh, it has measured cone resistance, sleeve friction and pore pressure, right? Depending upon the uh, complexity of the cone or how advanced the cone is or how many how many different types of sensors there are in the cone, you can measure all these things, right? You can see here how the cone resistance varies with depth, you can see here. So this here you can see at 7.5 to 8 meter depth, the cone res resistance is the highest. Right, so you can expect a very hard soil there, isn't it? So this you can correlate these values of uh, cone resistance. You can correlate with different types of soil. Again, similarly, sleeve friction also, frictional resistance also. You can measure uh, real time. Similarly, you can see pore pressure also. You can measure real time. All right. So these uh, parameters you can uh, measure real time. Here, another uh, image showing the same. You can see here. All right. So this is a basic. Uh, CPTU log, right? Cone penetration test log will look like this. Here you can see a, a soil uh, log detail. So this can be co developed by correlating these values with uh, empirical equations or empirical uh, experimental data. Okay. So basically, this data is used to estimate the end bearing and skin friction of a pile foundation. Okay. You can use this to uh, do a proper soil exploration, but the most important application here is to estimate the end bearing and skin friction of a pile foundation. We will see in detail what these parameters are when we learn design of pile foundations. Okay. Next comes geophysical methods. So this is the uh, last soil exploration method I want to talk about. So we saw different methods, direct methods, indirect methods and semi-direct methods, right? So we saw direct methods, direct methods where trial pits, test pits, etc. Right? Then we have semi-direct methods like boreholes and uh, these cone penetration tests, etc. Borings. Then comes the indirect test where you don't have any contact with the soil or you, you are not going to dig into the soil. So those indirect methods, the most important one or the most common ones are geophysical methods. Okay? So uh, we know that we saw the borehole location, uh, the map showing borehole location when I showed you the soil report, isn't it? So uh, we know that the soil profile change uh, profoundly it changes, isn't it? If you dig, uh, you know, uh, two boreholes, if you dig uh, 10 meters or 15 meters apart, you might be see, might, you might be seeing significant difference in the soil profiles, right? In most of the sites. So what lies in between these two boreholes, we don't know, correct? So we randomly we uh, figure out, uh, you know, randomly we uh, get data from different uh, boreholes 
but in between these boreholes we don't know what lies right between the boreholes we don't know the exact soil profile so geophysical methods actually will give you a continuous record of the subsoil profile all right so uh, boring and test pits provide definite results because we uh, we can see the soil we can feel the soil we can test the soil but they are very time consuming and expensive isn't it so uh, and another disadvantage is that uh, you know uh, as i mentioned the subsurface conditions are known only at the bore or te test pit location right so uh, the subsurface condition between those bore holes as i mentioned now uh, the 10 to 15 meter gap between two bore holes we don't know what lies uh, in between these two bore holes so that needs to be interpolated right so to avoid all that you can go for geophysical methods Uh, so you will get a continuous record of the complete soil profile subsoil profile so uh, these are much uh, cheaper and quicker and they cover the entire area but the problem is that they are less definitive and you need to be need to be an expert in that area you need to be able to interpret the test results very accurately so it depends upon how expert the person who is doing the test is it's you know it requires subjective interpretation so you have to be an expert in this to read out the data from the geophysical methods all right so it is it's less definite when compared to the other uh, direct or indirect method direct or semi direct methods so both both methods are important so even if you are going to uh, do a geophysical method you will definitely suppose you are doing a geophysical method for a 50 meter square area definitely you have to go for one or two bore holes to confirm what you have done right you will go for a geophysical method you will carry out the test you will get the sub complete subsoil profile then again you will further go and dig one or two bore holes to make sure that uh, the subsoil profile that you have identified from the geophysical methods it is correct you will have to correlate and validate it okay so uh, these methods basically uh, indicate uh, you know the definitive definitive boundaries between uh, different soil layers or drastically changing layers so common two methods are uh, seismic refraction method and the electrical resistivity method so the seismic refraction method so here you can see this is a schematic showing a seismic uh, refraction method so uh, this is uh, you can you can see here this this is a small blast here okay this is your source maybe a hammering or sudden impact or uh you know uh, you have to emanate a sudden shock wave all right you have to emanate a wave into the soil so this waves will travel into the soil and is picked up by these are all geophones okay or receivers so you will have a source here then you will fix the receivers at different locations you will space them equally and you will stretch them out to a uh, you know uh, out on the site okay so these are geophones or Uh, receivers okay then you will emanate a shock wave here and this waves are going to travel through the soil and it is going to be picked up by these receivers okay so one property of these waves are that they will refract when they travel from one medium to another right they are going to refract as you can see do you remember uh, refraction of light waves when they uh, travel through the atmosphere and water you might have seen a figure of a fish bowl uh, you know kept uh, and uh, you might have seen in your school you might have seen in your textbook that image would have been there no refraction uh, light wave travels through the atmosphere and once it enters the water it slightly uh, bends or tilts right due to difference in the density through which it travels right same principle is applied here so these waves will refract once they travel from one medium to another where the mediums have two different densities right so once they refract also depends up, depending upon this densities their velocity of travel also will change in different layers right so after you emanate this wave these waves are traveling through different layers they will refract and they are picked up by these uh, vibration detectors or receivers or geophones so from the source to the geophone they will measure the time of travel from the source to the receiver location they will measure the time of travel of all these waves there are two types of waves there are direct or primary waves and then there are refracted waves so these direct or primary waves they travel through the uh, ground surface travel along the ground surface and the other seismic waves they will travel through the soil 
and then they are refracted at the soil strata and then they travel back then they are picked up by the uh, geophones so if the underlying layers of soil if they are denser then the refracted waves will travel faster right and they also travel at longer distances so the shock waves actually reach the geophones faster right uh, then uh, once you find out the time uh, the waves took to reach from the source to the uh, geophones the time it uh, was picked up by the uh, receiver you can you can plot the distance versus time graphs and you can actually plot the depth of various strata so this needs some expertise uh, to read out the uh, you know uh, field data you need to be an expert in this so based on a distance time graph you can actually correlate it with the different layer depth and different the layer densities depending upon the velocity of travel of these waves so different uh, materials like gravel sand etc have definitive properties and can be identified by that distance versus time graph so uh, but again uh, for a definitive uh, you know for a definitive uh, identification you still have to go for uh, field test you have to supplement your geophysical test with a field test so that you can correlate and validate your test results here you can see another image of seismic refraction method you can see the energy source here here you can see uh, the first layer velocity is 1000 second layer it is 5000 third layer it is 15000 you can see this is bedrock so based on these velocities also you can correlate different soil profiles basically there is a nehrp classification national earthquake hazard reduction program guidelines are there which have defined shear wave velocity of different soil uh, types all right there are uh, you know nehrp national earthquake hazard reduction program classifications ranging from uh, soil classification a to uh, i think f right so uh, site uh, classification a and b are uh, rock profiles where the uh, velocity ranges from 700 to 1400 meter per second that is site classification a which is the highest one so that represents rock right similarly from uh, velocity 400 to uh, 700 it is uh, site classification b like that you have correlations uh, which can be correlations for soil type and uh, shear wave velocity so this can be correlated and here you can apply that concept to you know identify what type of soil lies beneath based on the shear wave velocity so that velocity how do you calculate depending upon the this distance you know and how much time it took for this wave to refract and come back to this detectors or geophones right so you will calculate the velocity and you will correlate the velocity with different soil profiles and how the uh, what the disposition of different strata are right another method is electric resistivity method so here what you are going to measure is the resistivity of different soils as you can see here you will place uh, different uh, you know uh, these metal spikes you can see there are four metal spikes so uh, they act as electrodes and they are spaced equally in soil as you can see in this figure all right they are driven into the ground at equal distances and uh, uh, in between the two outer electrodes uh, you uh, measure the uh, you apply a direct voltage and the potential drop is actually measured between the two inner electrodes you apply a voltage to the outer electrodes and you find out the potential drop between the inner electrodes all right so to test a larger area you can actually increase this spacing so that this waves travel travel further or longer and you can find out this uh, potential drop in between this inner electrodes so depending upon the area that you want to test you can increase this spacing basically so here you can see these electrodes these are four electrodes and you apply a direct current and they travel through the soil and this two inner electrodes they find out the potential drop between them so different materials of course have different resistivities right so depending upon the soil density and properties that resistivity varies isn't it so uh, you can correlate this electrical resistivity between 
different soil densities and different soil types you have uh, correlations for that experimental data based on that so that you can correlate and you can identify what is the resistivity of the soil based on that you can correlate it and find out what is the uh, property of the soil underneath and what type of soil it can be so a subsoil profile can also be developed based on electrical resistivity tests right so here also after the test you might have to you know you come you uh, carry out an electrical resistivity test throughout the site and once the test is done you may you know uh, go for one or two boreholes at the site and again you correlate and find out what exactly lies beneath and whether your test results are correct so these are indirect methods you are not going to make any uh, you know cut or uh, borehole or any pits in the soil you are going to use geophysical methods like this so these methods are called indirect methods so with that we wind up soil exploration